Tonight we want to talk a little bit about the subject of renunciation. And there are many important points to be made about this subject. It's a very important subject because real renunciation does not really have to do with an outer lifestyle that we lead whether we're married or not married, whether we have children or don't have children, any of that, that's not the essence of renunciation. Renunciation basically is this. It's to overcome the delusion that the things of this world are going to fulfill us. And in fact, because we have so long been attracted to and working in the realm of the physical world and the senses, we actually need to overcome an addiction to restlessness and an addiction to uh, the senses and to the things of this world. We, were, we had lunch with our friend Gurav today and we were talking about the current generation of young people being so into electronic media, how many screens there are, and how many uh, iPhones and smartphones and tablets, and we saw some time ago a, uh, a kind of a documentary on the good parts and the bad parts of the electronic revolution and being connected all the time. And one of the segments showed, talked about South Korea. In South Korea they have huge pavilions where young people come in and they play video games all day long. And they have big consoles and very fast computers and so they play these video games for 10 hours, 12 hours every day. And after a while they begin to lose the ability to really relate to any other reality and so they have actually set up as part of the government has set up kind of camps where they can go to overcome their addiction to video games and they force them terrible terrible punishment for them not to have any electronic devices for a week. And it's very, very hard for them to overcome that desire to be constantly stimulated. There's, you know, it's not just kind of the uh, mental aspect. After a while there comes to be a brain chemical reaction so that we're constantly needing to have that stimulation in order to stimulate parts of the brain. Well, what are those video games? Those video games are an attempt to create reality. Not the reality that we know, but a more, let's call it, exciting reality. A reality that is even more stimulating than the one that we live in. But we have to realize that we too are living in a giant video game. Only it's the video game of the five senses. Those video games that the young people are playing really only involve two senses, maybe three, but certainly sight and sound, maybe third if you think of the movement of hands as touch. But also because that video game has a beginning and an end, and then they enter into another reality, they can realize, even though it's difficult, but they can realize that that's not the only reality. We're even more unfortunate, because we're born and we die, most of the people, without ever exiting this reality. And therefore, we can't really realize, it's or at least it's very difficult to realize that this reality is not the sum total of life's experience, of the experience of being human. Some, we were in Calcutta at a beautiful weekend 
in Kolkata. I did a Korea initiation at Master's Home and some programs and also visited the mission and the tomb of Mother Teresa. It was an extremely inspiring time, but there was young, one young woman at a satsang who came up and very pleadingly asked afterwards a question that has probably occurred to any thoughtful person, what is the meaning of life? Now, if life is only a video game, then most video games you accumulate points or you accumulate rewards or you accumulate something for playing that game well. And after some period of time, if you learn how to play well, you may even become very competitive and you cease playing just for yourself and you get online and you play against other players and suppose that you become extremely good and you become the national champion or regional champion or even world champion at some particular video game and let's call that video game wealth and so you become a Bill Gates now when you're at that level of playing it's very very difficult then to extract yourself from that reality it's very difficult to say, oh, this is just a game. It doesn't mean anything. And that's the problem, is that we get really, really caught in this video game of life. Well, renunciation, the essence of it, has nothing to do with lifestyle. It has nothing to do with whether you wear blue or yellow or live in an ashram or don't live in an ashram. It has to do with whether you are making a conscious effort to de-addict yourself from being caught in the system of success and failure, reward and punishment of this video game. Because it's very, very stimulating. It's not as if it's as easy as just to say, say, we could play this, what I've been saying, back to most people, and they might nod their head, but they wouldn't take the beginning of the first step, the shadow of a thought of the first step in extracting themselves, because it's very, very addictive. I read a startling study about this study was done at a large university and then it was replicated around the world. And what they asked of people was that they go into a room with a chair and they do nothing for 15 minutes. There were no phones, there were no screens, there was no noise, there was, they just were supposed to sit there for 15 minutes. The students, and then as I say, it was replicated, so it's not just students that we're talking about, but the people found it by and large to be absolute torture. Given the choice, almost 95% would pay $5 to get out of the room more quickly than 15 minutes. They went on to give these people going into the room the possibility of having a kind of stimulation. But that stimulation was a mild shock, about as uh, strong of a shock as you get if you move your feet across a carpet and then touch something. So a little static shock. Not a big one, but unpleasant enough. So none of us sitting in this room would purposely rub our feet on the um, carpet and give ourselves a shock. But something like 40% of the people preferred giving themselves a shock to sitting in the room for 15 minutes without being stimulated. One student shocked himself 200 times in that 15 minute period. And so 
See, what I'm saying is that even, even if the stimulation is unpleasant, we're addicted to having stimulation. And so what we need to do as we begin to get less addicted to this game of life is we need to begin to pull back from some of the more obvious elements that, that are addictive. And so one of the first steps on the spiritual path is to do away with those things that are chemically addictive, to do away with drugs, to do away with drinking alcohol, to do away, if possible, with um, smoking, and those things that are chemically addicting to the mind. Because as long as we're chemically addicted, it makes it difficult for us not to, not to be engaged all the time. We had a friend who had a good sense of humor, a friend in the early years of Ananda, and very, very few people smoked there, but he still smoked after he uh, came from, he was a, by that time still a, a kind of a middle-aged man, maybe in his late 40s or 50s, and he'd smoked all his life and found it very difficult to get up. But he had to give up, but he had a sense of humor, and he said, I know that I should give up smoking, but I can't seem to. He said, when I die, I'm going to have to reincarnate the next day into the body of a woman who smokes and drinks coffee just so I can get my caffeine and my nicotine. And he was laughing at that himself. But we reincarnate basically from a place that is much more beautiful, much more uplifted, much more enlightened than this plane. And we incarnate because we're addicted to the stimulation of the consciousness through the senses. And that's, that's basically what's going on. So, Master, uh, the whole of the spiritual path, or Swamiji said, the whole of the spiritual path is overcoming the ego, which is the soul that becomes identified with the body and personality. In this sense, we could say it's the soul that lives in cosmic consciousness, wanting to be condensed enough so that it can play the video game of life where the senses are stimulated and where the sense of separation and I in a competitive mode against others is stimulated. And so that we, even from an astral heaven, we choose, because of past karmic tendencies, like that man at Ananda who said he was addicted to caffeine and nicotine, were addicted to fame or wealth or uh, competitiveness, or being smart, or being beautiful, or ones of tens and tens of thousands of other things. And so we choose again and again to come back into this world, and then we live out a life, and gradually, gradually, it takes a long, long time until, as Master said, we have a sense of anguishing monotony of this. So I imagine even those boys going 12 hours a day at the pavilion playing video games in South Korea end up with a sense of anguishing monotony and say, I've got to detox from this. Well, renunciation is our way of detoxing from this life. Now, Swamiji, in the booklet, our book, uh, Renunciation for a New Age, talks about several very important things. One, he says, is that renunciation should be not world-denying, uh, but samadhi-affirming. In other words, we don't pull back from this world 
because we get punished. That boy who shocked himself 200 times in 15 minutes didn't pull back from the need to be stimulated simply because he was being punished. In fact, punishment is just one more way of stimulating. And so, reward, punishment, they're two sides of the same coin. But in a sense, both are equally stimulating. And so we don't pull back by saying, no, don't do that, no, don't do that, no, don't do that. What we pull back from is by affirming how much more wonderful it will be if we channel our energy not outwardly, but inwardly. And so the essence of renunciation is to make the choice to re-channel or redirect our energies from going in an outward direction into stimulation of one sort or another into an inner direction where the stimulation and in this sense the actual rate of vibration of consciousness begins to slow down. And when we begin to slow down then we begin to perceive an inner world that is much more attractive to the soul. Remember, it's the soul that has become identified with the body, but the inner world is much more attractive to the soul than the outer world. And so when we begin to make the choice to come within, then the soul becomes more and more into its natural habitat until finally we break through the ego, this desire for separation, the delusion of separation, and we go into the great states that the yogis talk about, the state of samadhi. And so as Swamiji said, renunciation should be samadhi affirming, not world renouncing. Because world renouncing would be fine. It just doesn't work. It doesn't work very well. And so by affirming samadhi, then we affirm our own true nature, our own higher nature. Swami also laid out kind of different steps or even stages in the New Age Renunciation. There's pilgrim, there's uh, brahmachari, tyagi, and Naya Swami. Naya Swami, he added the word Naya because he wanted people to recognize this as being a different, a new kind of renunciation. And if we weren't called Naya Swamis and just Swamis, then the tendency would be to say, well, you can't be a Swami. You, you don't wear orange. You don't you were married, you're still married. How can you be a Swami? You aren't a Swami. And all we do is have to battle against old thought forms. So Swami said, why fight against those old thought forms? If the essence of renunciation is inward, not outward, why have to battle people who want to define you as some outward category? He said, we'll be Naya Swami will be samadhi-affirming swamis or samadhi-affirming brahmacharis or tyagis. But the essence of all of the vows doesn't really matter, these categories. It's really kind of like a piece of fruit ripening a little bit. We're all apples. Some of us have ripened a little more in our desire to lead a life of first inner renunciation, and then outer renunciation. Why outer renunciation at all? Frankly, many of us were a little bit uncomfortable with an outer renunciation. We would prefer, many of us have been renunciates for tens of you know, years and years and years, and would have preferred to just stay as an inward renunciates. But Swamiji, in his wisdom, said that this world needs some outer examples of people doing this to, 
almost as if to spark conversation. And he sometimes would do things just in order to spark conversation or even debate. And so part of that is to show that there can be a formal kind of a renunciation that leads to happiness, that leads to joy, that leads to a life that's successful and a life that doesn't look all that much different from the life of everyone. And so to spark the questioning about should I do this? But regardless of the steps or the stages or any of that having to do with the outer aspect of it, all of the vows basically begin with the understanding that the purpose of life is to search for God and to achieve God. And then other things follow from that, how strictly you want to apply that basic principle to your life. So, uh, samadhi affirming the real essence of renunciation, being a search for God, and the gradual or not so gradual withdrawal from being in outward stimulation all the time. One of the great teachings of the Masters is that satsang, or the company that we keep, is extremely important. Master said that environment is stronger than willpower, individual willpower, because if you were trying to be a renunciate and you spent all of your time with people who were trying to become millionaires, it makes it difficult We've talked with many people who work in environments where they basically can't reveal their spiritual side. Or if they do reveal it, they can only reveal it to one or two people at work, but they certainly can't, um, can't lead the life of an outward seeker without having so much pressure from those who don't agree with that as a purpose of life, that it's just not worth it. So that environment of getting together with others who understand that the purpose of life is the quest for God is very, very important. And so I'm very happy that we have opportunities like this to gather together with other truth seekers and to reinforce these great teachings in one another. And I'll just end by saying that Swamiji was extremely kind. He did not like to define things in an outward way. So he always made these attempts, the seeking of God, the if you're going to renounce, whether inwardly or outwardly, always made it directional. And so it wasn't like if you made a vow and then I'm never going to smoke again, and then you broke that vow and you smoked again, that you were some kind of terrible sinner. He always said, it's directional. He said, he himself used this example of being someone who smoked. And when he would smoke again, after he was trying to give it up, he would say not, I have failed. He would say, I just haven't quite succeeded yet. And so with renunciation, which is a million times more important and more complicated than something like giving up smoking, giving up the addiction to maya, now that's a real accomplishment. Are we going to fail? Of course we're going to fail. So why use failure as an excuse not to make the effort? Simply say, none. I haven't yet succeeded. And say that not only for yourself, but for others too. Swami was extraordinarily kind and extraordinarily supportive to people 
because he recognized that this is a very hard to accomplish. Not very many in the Gita it says, one out of a thousand seeks me, and one perhaps out of the thousands that seek me finds me. We know it's a difficult thing. 999 people aren't even interested in doing this. And so for ourselves and for others, let's be very patient, very loving, and very supportive. And ultimately, when we live in this way, and Davy and I now have lived amongst seekers for long enough and in a wide enough variety of people, we can attest to the fact that when we live this way, we are happier and more fulfilled than when we don't. And I'll also share a few words. And thank you all for joining us. Swami wrote this wonderful booklet of Renunciate Order for the New Age because he understood that with Yogananda's teachings, and particularly with the practice of Kriya Yoga, that we have the ability now to start having control over our inner energy. And he wanted to, I really believe that this renunciate order is an outgrowth of the life of a Kriya Yogi because we begin to realize that our, we are free on the inside. We have control of our inner, inner energy. We aren't necessarily driven by compulsions. And so he really was trying to demonstrate or illustrate a lifestyle that is conducive to the life of a Kriyavan. So we have our inner practices, that, but then how do we go about our daily life? And so one might even say the whole of the renunciate order, like one might say, is a lifestyle for Kriyavans, whatever outward form our life may take. and. We, as Jatish mentioned, uh, over the weekend, we went to Calcutta with Vivek, Chichilya, Nipa, who are all here, and um, uh, Stephen was there as well. And we went, we had the real blessing, I'd say, to go to the uh, tomb of Mother Teresa of Calcutta, and felt such inspiration there and then when we returned, uh, one of the monks who lives here, Ahmed showed us a movie that was made about the life of Saint Ter Mother Teresa. And I found it very interesting, the juxtaposition between the traditional monastic life that she came from. She was a, lived in a convent, part of the uh, Sisters of Loreto, very withdrawn from the world, never leaving their little walls of their monastery. And then one day, because they had run, it was after the partition of Pakistan and India, they, there were riots in Calcutta, there was not food to feed the young student, the young girls that were the students. She and another sister ventured out to see if they could find food. And all of a sudden, they saw hungry people, just as in the life of Buddha, when his father, the young prince Siddhartha, his father wouldn't let him leave the beautiful uh, gardens he had created, because at Buddha's birth, a sadhu came and predicted that he would either be a great king or a great spiritual teacher, and, his, and uh, Siddhartha's father didn't want him to be a great spiritual teacher. He wanted him to carry on the kingdom. So he protected him, and he kept him in that kingdom. But one day he wandered out, and you probably know all the story. He saw disease and poverty and old age, and it was an utter shock to him. And he said, this has happened to everyone. And his chariot driver said, yes, sire. And he said, well, then how, what is the way out? He said, well, there is no way out. This is life. And 
Buddha Siddhartha at that time determined that he would find the way out of suffering by inner realization, and that's what he did. Well, going back to Mother Teresa, there she was in that convent, very protected from all the suffering going on around her. But then when she left and she saw, she said, how can I just be concerned about these 12 little girls who are coming to us in our convent when there are hundreds of thousands of people in this city with no food and no clothes and no medical attention? And she went to her spiritual superiors and asked if she could do this work to help them. And they said, oh, no, no, no. This, your order, only you stay in here. But she felt God's call. And so she, we all know the story of her life. She transcended the typical monastic life. And, and even if it meant her not being a nun anymore, she was willing to do that to serve other people. And that's true renunciation, giving up even the comforts and the security of the nice little life in the convent. And so for all of us at this time, we need to understand that without that sense of inner renunciation, and, and I'll give you examples of what I mean by that, that we're, we can be practicing Kriya Yoga very nicely, we can have experiences in meditation, but if we are not living what our, our deep faith, our deep devotion to Guru, then it's, it's really not all that effective, no matter how much we meditate. As Jatish said, we've seen many different examples of people on the spiritual path, people who meditated long hours every day, and, but we're be, in that process became very selfish and self-focused. And then we saw people who were just thinking, I don't care about myself. I want to help other people, as Mother Teresa did. And those are the people that you see are growing closer to God. So, so let me give some wonderful examples in this little book. What does it look like in our daily life to be an inner renunciate? Well, let's talk about different possibilities, different situations in daily life. I think we all start with anger and uh, thwarted will. If we really we want to do something and it doesn't go our way, and then we get angry and honk our horn or jump out. And I mean, you see this every day on the streets of the great cities of India, people in conflict, this isn't what I wanted and you're thwarting my will. Well, instead of saying renunciation means I must suppress the will, it's not ego denying, it's expansive, it's samadhi affirming. So instead of getting angry when things don't go your way, just relax and say, God, what do you want, not what do I want? And when we, and every time when you start to feel that energy coming, no, this is the way it has to be. And if it's not, then you say, all right, God, what is it that you want? Let me expand into a bigger reality. And um, there was a beautiful story from the Master's life where it was at a, a, a I think a wedding actually, and he was giving some of the uh, women renunciates different colored roses. And he, I mean, it, it boggles the mind to think if Master would give you a rose, you would say, oh, I didn't want that one. I wanted, I didn't want the red one, I wanted the pink one. But this woman said that, and Master looked at her very sternly, because it wasn't a little thing. He said, what God gives, you take. Meaning, get above the likes and dislikes and preferences. And why? Is it evil? Is it bad? It's limiting. It, well, you will never be happy as long as you are expecting the world to be the way you outlined it. I don't know if you've noticed yet, but the world doesn't usually respond the way we want it to. It has its own agenda. And if we want to be happy, we have to say, all right, God, what's your agenda? Clearly, my agenda is not playing out here. So working, renouncing the sense of 
anger, the sense of having things to be your own way, expanding it into a sense of God, whatever you give, let me accept it and enjoy it. Another situation we find all the time is in working, either in a family or a business, where people have differing opinions. And we kind of, again, want to assert, I'm right, you're wrong, I see this much more clearly than you do, this is how we need to proceed. But to rather than saying, okay, I'll never have an opinion, I'll always do what other people think, that's not the right attitude. But to expand, in, in, even in a work situation, and just say, let me consider that other people's opinions might be better than my own. Let me expand and learn from them. I saw Swamiji do this all the time, even from people who one might dismiss as not very wise, not very perceptive or discriminating. Sometimes they would come to him and say, Swamiji, I think this would be a good course for Ananda, or I think this would be better if we did it this way. And he would stop and he would consider even if it was something he hadn't thought of. And he would say, you know, I think you're right. And the joy of expanding and embracing other people's opinions instead of thinking my way. You know, there's an expression in English, in, in America, I don't know if it's in India, but it, it kind of captures the American spirit, unfortunately. It's my way or the highway. You know, <laughs> my way or you're out of here. But it's so limiting. And part of the joy of cooperative community is the blending and the creative energy and ideas of many, many people. That's why Swami's beautiful song, Many Hands Make a Miracle. Many hearts, many minds, many hands. And if you only want to do it your way, you'll get a certain amount done, but it'll be limited but to expand into accepting other people's realities. Another common situation in daily life has to do with our possessions. Like, this is mine, and it's not yours, and maybe I'll give you a bit of that, but I'm going to keep it for myself. And again, is that wrong? Is it bad? It's just limiting. And if we can get, I have learned this over and over, if there's something that I really like and I'm using, but I can see someone else could really benefit from it, even though it's sort of like, you know, I'm ripping off a band-aid, I'm not quite sure I want to give that, but I will. Whenever you do that, it's like it comes back many, many times what I gave away. You get to the point where you want to say, I think I need a little more, so I'll give this away, because you know it'll come back more. There's a story in Autobiography of the Yogi where uh, one of the saints that Master writes about had, uh, was a, had a wonderful spiritual work. And he had come from a very, very wealthy family in India, but it, he renounced it all to live in that life of renunciation. And some of his disciples praised him and said, oh, Master, what a great renunciate you are. And he said, how can you say that? It's quite the contrary. It's the worldly people who are the renunciants because they renounce true happiness for a few in, in exchange for worldly security. He said, I've given up a few baubles and trinkets for the immeasurable treasure of God in my life constantly. So just to expand your awareness, to give, to to say, nothing is really mine. You know, we've mentioned in other circumstances that we had a, at Ananda, there was a forest fire in uh, 1976, and it destroyed the community. Tratish and I lost every, just about every physical possession we had. And you know, it didn't make a difference. And I had to live through that to realize that. I wouldn't have known that. We had a nice house, nice little possessions. One day we had it, the next day it was all gone. And yet I realized I'm the same person. 
I'm still basically happy. I'm a little bit disoriented because I don't know how we're going to move forward. But it, it, the sense of expansion that comes from realizing you can, move, you can give anything away. There's nothing that you can't give away that you won't be better off for doing that. So look, expanding beyond your sense of your own possessions. Another typical monastic uh, perception is, okay, we won't relate to men and women and we'll just separate ourselves from the world. Well, rather than withdrawing and saying, you know, I can't relate to members of the opposite sex, just to expand it and say, all men are my brothers and my fathers, all women are my sisters and my friends. And, and just to, to say that it, we don't have to cut ourselves off from people, but to love them with God's love, not with any personal um, agenda, any personal needs or desires, but just to love all, even your own family your own children, love them as gods, because they are. They're not yours. I, most people probably have, in their lifetime, lost a loved one or a friend through passing away. And you realize, no one is mine. They, we all come on this stage for a time, and then we interact with others, and then we leave. But as uh, the Hari Mahashaya said, we come into this world alone and we leave it alone. Make the acquaintance of God now. And so just to have an expansive relationship with men and women, but from a center, again, from the, from, as a Kriyabhan, where you feel like my energy is under my control. I know that I have I can make the right discriminating choices in my life. And then finally, just to all, Jatish was talking quite a bit about all the distractions of the world. Well, rather than saying, I won't think about this and I won't think about that and I'll never watch a movie again and I'll never play a video game again, instead of saying no to a million things, say, say yes to one thing. And that yes is, I will love God with all my heart. And whatever else comes into my life, I will watch it as God's dream. But if we, the love of God, wholehearted, one-pointed, is what burns away all other attachments to this world. You know, Master used the expression, once you've tasted the divine nectar of God's presence, who wants to eat stale cheese? And so the, the essence of true renun renunciation is rooted in deep, deep, wholehearted love for God. And if we can do that, everything else falls into place. And we don't have to be tying ourselves up in knots about, I shouldn't do this and I shouldn't do that. We live in a constant flow of joy because we know that the true purpose of life is to feel God's presence within. And everything else is a way station on our journey. But don't stop too long. Keep moving towards the goal.